It's good to see everybody here this morning. Thankful that the Lord has given us this day to gather together and to worship Him. Let's look in our course books to page number 10. Page number 10 in our course books. This is the Christ of the Cross. Song number three. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify. So I cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. The Christ of the cross, so despised by the world, as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear sin on God. So I cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. On the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. It was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. To the Christ of the cross, I will ever be true. His shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday. For by his grace I am saved, and his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross, till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross, and I'll praise him in glory that day. Amen. We're here to worship the Christ of the cross. Lamb slain. All right, Robert's going to come and read for us. Good morning. Good morning. Psalm 120 reading of the Lord's word. In my distress, 
I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty, the cold of the universe. <clears throat> Woe is me, and I sojourn in me say, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul has long dwelt with him that has peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you, and we praise you. We thank you for the word, because we know the word is Christ. Lord, we know that by nature we are God-haters, and it's only by your grace in Christ that we are saved. Let us look to you today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Psalm 120 would have been one that our Lord would have prayed back to his Father in his suffering and oppression by his enemies. But let's all remember that before the Lord's, our sin nailed him to the cross. And it was a contradiction of our sin and us as sinners that he endured to save such wretches as we are. Let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover, sing this to the tune of This Is My Father's World. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who was from hell to raise, has shed my reconciling blood. We give thee endless praise, God and yet man the Lord, true God, true man art thou, of man and of men serve the heart, one with us thou art now, great sacrifice for sin, giver Restorer of the peace within, true and earn of the strife. To thee, the Christ of God, the saints exalted sing. The bearer of our heavy Lord, our own anointed King, true lover. John 16. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, where goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye shall see me no more. 
of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall speak not of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and will show it unto you. A little while and ye shall not see me. And again in a little while ye shall see me because I go to the Father. Then said some of the disciples among themselves, what is this that he saith unto us? A little while and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall turn into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because he hath loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Let me pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words that we read, dear Lord, and pray that our eyes will be opened and ears to hear, dear Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, our righteousness. We are sinners, dear Lord. We have no righteousness, but it is solely in our Lord Jesus Christ who is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Be with Ken as he brings forth this message, proclaiming Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thankful for that reading. Every time I read that chapter, Lord opens my eyes to see more and more of him. Let's take our hymn books, turn to hymn number 309. 309, we'll stand and sing this together before the message of the hour. 309, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Beneath the Cross of Jesus, I fain would take my 
Ecclesiastes chapter 7, as we continue our study through Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 is my text, and the title might seem a little bit like a downer, as they say in modern English, the house of mourning, how vital is it to come to the house of mourning? Here we read in Ecclesiastes 7, a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Everybody's all about celebrating birthdays. But here he says that it's better the day of death than the day of one's birth. Now this does not apply to everybody. Because there are those that the day of death is nothing but ushering them into condemnation. I believe Solomon, again, being one of the lords, and as a man had everything you could ever dream of. He would be somebody that if you went to give a gift, you would say, well, what do you give to somebody that has everything anyway? Now here I believe that God is causing Solomon to reflect upon his life and the vanity as we've been seeing all of throughout here of having all things and yet what is the one vital thing that matters remember that these chapter divisions were put in here to help us find our place and read so I can tell you we'll turn to Ecclesiastes 7 look at verse 1 but this is in connection with what he had said previously in chapter 6 and verse 12. For who knoweth what is good for man in this life? All the days of his vain life which he spendeth as a shadow. Think about how quickly time goes by. When we were younger, we had many years in front of us. But the older we get, we perceive how quickly, now time hasn't sped up, but the time we have left to live compared to what we have lived is shorter and shorter. And we acknowledge that. And that if we have put our confidence only in things of this life, I don't care whether it's material, 
whether it's friends, relationships, associations, or whether it's health, all of these things are vanity. I had an old friend associate that lived to be 98, and he told me, he said, I don't go to funerals anymore. And I said, well, why not? And he said, I don't know anybody that hadn't already died. That was the reality that as he lived on, the longer he lived, even his acquaintances were gone. And that's what he's speaking of, all the days of his vain life, which he spent as a shadow. This is speaking specifically of unconverted sinners. That's why we're not jealous of them, of the things that the Lord has given them, because we know it's temporal. They don't own these things. We don't own what we have. They're lent to us. Someone that has been on a deathbed and been brought back, they'll tell you, well, I got a new lease on life. Well, that's all it is, a lease. And unless you're the Lord's, unless he has redeemed you and draws you by his spirit, that lease, when it is up, there's nothing but condemnation that awaits. But it says, who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? Even with all of these things, man is not in charge. We live the number of days exactly as God gives us. And so it's in that context here that Solomon, read on, a good name is better than precious ointment. The idea of precious ointment, where was precious ointment found? It was found in king's palaces. It speaks here of the incense that often would be burnt in king's palaces. Remember, they didn't have air conditioning back then. And so in many of these places where it was humid and things would become musty smelling, oh, how precious an ointment it was to burn and smell that sweet savor as opposed to really what in this world is nothing but a, a scent of death, a stench. You go along the road and all of a sudden you smell a dead smell. Well, that's a smell of either an animal or something that has died. And all, all you're smelling is the, the remnant of that. But a good name is better than precious ointment. Now you notice that the word good is an italic. So here it just says a name, having a name is better than precious ointment. Understood in that word name is the idea of one that people would remember, not for the wealth and riches that one might have, but the very person. I know people have a tendency to say that today. Well, they were a good person when they died. And people gather to speak about the person. And usually what they attribute as good is it might have been somebody that cared about a lot of different people and helped them out during their lifetime. And so that's what they consider to be a good name. People talk today about leaving a good legacy. What do you want to be remembered for when you're gone? What do you want people to say about you at the funeral? This is the kind of thinking that goes on in natural minds. But when we consider that this is our end, that we're all going to die, unless the Lord Jesus Christ is pleased to come again and to usher all of his own that he's redeemed into his presence it will be at the end of the world. We all know that every day that we live, it doesn't matter how joyous we live or how good a day it seems like we talk about, our end is marked and it's already been written in God's book. You don't determine that. I don't determine that. The days of our lives are already ordained of God. And that day, as it approaches, what's vital? What's important? 
Well, here, Solomon, and it's not just that he's having a down day. He's thinking about life itself, thinking about what's precious unto him as one that God blessed extraordinarily, not just with riches and wealth and position and power, but wisdom to rule the people. But he says, it's better to go to the house of mourning. Here's where we get the title of this message, the house of mourning, than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men. I don't believe that we should be as some of the old Puritans were in their day. If you cracked a smile, you were sinning. And so everywhere they went, the head was down. They could hardly even express any kind of joy because that in of itself they considered to be sin. That's not the picture here. I see it rather as God has ordained our days. And yes, when he gives us days that we can rejoice. And you think about how our beings are affected by whether the sun shines or not. We tend to judge things based on feelings, but feelings come and feelings go. Or gathering together with friends. It's not that that's a sin. We gather, we rejoice. We enjoy what time the Lord gives us, but let it always be in our minds that that's but temporal. And there's no lasting joy that can come even from these temporal blessings that the Lord gives really to all men, whether his or not. Christ said that God causes the sun to rise upon the just and the unjust, causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. Wouldn't that be something if the Lord only sent rain to his children? That'd be pretty easy to figure out who was his children. then, Because you look down the road, it's raining on this person's house, but then misses all the rest of the neighborhood. And you'd be sitting there thinking, well, that's, that's one of the Lord's. But you can't judge who's the Lord's and who's not by temporal blessings. He causes the sun to, to shine on the just and the unjust. He causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. Is saying here in verse 2, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feast. It doesn't say that it's wrong to go to the house of feast. Even our Lord, Jesus, went to a marriage in Cana and turned the water into wine. He was invited at different times where he went and sat down with the people, and he was often criticized, especially by those Puritans of his day, the Pharisees. That's what the word Pharisee means. It means a a purist. They were aghast how the Lord could ever go even and sit down and eat and drink with sinners. But the reason he did is because that's why he came in the world to identify with sinners and to pay the sin debt of those sinners that the Father had given him. That's why he went from place to place. But also we find him going to funerals. One of the most classic that we read about is that of Lazarus, where they sought to influence our Lord to come before Lazarus would die, but God purposed that he would die. Christ took his time getting there because he had purposed that through the death of Lazarus, he would manifest himself as the resurrection of the life. And when he arrived, they mocked him. When he instructed them to show him where they had put Lazarus. It had already been three days. It was the fourth day. And they were thinking, well, his body stinks already. But our Lord, when they took him to that place, called Lazarus forth. Lazarus, come forth. Such is the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a house of mourning that the Lord blessed. And so... When we think about the house of mourning, what is a house of mourning? The word house means a dwelling place. When we're finished here, we're likely each one go back to our house. What's in that house? Well, it's a place to rest, 
It's a place to eat. It's the place to dwell. It's a house. And there are times where the Lord makes our dwellings, and here I think in terms of metaphorically, our lot in life. It's not always feasting. Thank the Lord for those times when there is that rejoicing and where he gives that rejoicing and we rejoice. Even the scripture says that, doesn't it? Rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. These are times of God's providence that he brings us through. And yet here, he says that if there were a choice between the house of feasting and the house of mourning, if you left up to us, we'd never dwell in a house of mourning. It would always be happy and feasting. But that would be a wrong view of life because everything about this life is under a curse. And so we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen flesh. And were it not that the Spirit of God should, should so direct our hearts and God in his sovereignty direct our paths from time to time to this house of mourning, this dwelling place of mourning, we would never know our end. We would not even stop to consider it. That's why the psalmist says, if you look over there in Psalm 119 and verse 71, now we could not say this were it not that the Spirit of God well, in us, we just finished reading through Psalm 119. It took several weeks to do so. But look what the psalmist says here. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. You stop and consider God's path for you over your life. Yes, you think back with good memories. You think about getting together with friends. You think about joyous days. But if I were to ask you, what have you learned most from as far as your life and your path? And what is it that God has used to draw him closer to himself? you'd have to say it was in the house of mourning. And I would say that begins with the work of the spirit in the heart, where we were ignorant of God's holiness and justice. And we went about to establish our own righteousness and found some measure of comfort, even in places of worship where Christ wasn't preached. And then when it pleased God to open our eyes by his spirit and cause us to weep over our sinfulness, not just this sin and that, but our sinful state before a holy God. And if the Lord has so taught you, you know what I'm talking about. Lay you low to where there is no hope apart from the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work that he accomplished at Calvary. That's where it all begins. And that's where we begin to see in this life that all is indeed vanity apart from the one work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop and think about it. Our Lord went to the house of mourning. Scripture says he was the man of what? Sorrows acquainted with grief. He didn't come down here to have a party. He didn't come down here to whip people up into a frenzy and a whoop de doo like people talk about being filled with the Spirit. You want to know what it is to be filled with the Spirit? Look how our Lord Jesus Christ walked on this earth. He was given the Spirit without measure. But everything about him was taking on this flesh had to do with the suffering, the sorrow that was due his people 
and he bore it himself. His house of mourning was none other than that cross. And yet he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem and would not be deterred. Why? Because it was going to be in that house of mourning, that is, his death, that he would, God the Father would justify once for all those sinners that he gave. That it would be in that house of mourning that our Lord Jesus Christ would reconcile unto himself those sinners that he came to save. I believe in Psalm 119.71, those would be the words even of our Lord. It is good for me that I've been afflicted. And knowing how we don't bear our sin condemnation, if we're the Lord's, he bore it. That's what brings us joy. But it will be again through a path of affliction. Why does the Lord afflict his children in this world? I told you it begins with his dealing in our heart, causing us to see the sinfulness of our sin, but even through life. Well, the scriptures say that whom the Lord, what? Loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son. You don't want to be left to yourself, to a life that's nothing but apparent feasting and gaiety and levity. Now, thank God that moment by moment, he brings us again and again to this house of mourning and afflicts his children, chastens them, lest they should ever put their confidence in any way in this flesh. So much for that saying, well, believe in Jesus and all be well. I will tell you, that's where my problems began. Believing in the Lord Jesus. Because it was through that spirit of grace drawing me unto Christ that I've been made to see that there's nothing in this life that has any lasting value. It's only in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to be drawn to him as the Christ, it puts you in opposition with everything in this world. This Jesus that in whom we believe by God's grace is not the Jesus of the world. The world wants a popular Jesus. They want one of health, wealth, and prosperity. And in fact, that's why most Congregations are willing to preach in that way. Well, if you just come to this Jesus, you're going to find all of your needs taken care of. Well, that's not what Christ said. In fact, Bob, in his reading there in John chapter 16, if you notice the very last verse, what does he say to his disciples there in John chapter 16? These things... Verse 33, I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. Let's say you might. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. How is it we have any hope in this world? It's because he is overcoming. And I dare say that that name that is better than precious ointment, anything that this world has to offer, that name is the name of Christ, to bear his name, to be given that name. It's better than anything this world has to offer. In fact, our Lord Jesus, remember when the disciples were sent out to heal the sick and to cast out devils, and they came back rejoicing that the Lord had given them that power. But even at best, that was temporary healing. It wasn't everybody that was healed or had the devils cast out that necessarily was the Lord. It was the Lord manifesting his power as the Messiah. That there's no power on earth that can keep him from saving any one of his own. But if you look over in Luke chapter 10 and verse 20, what did the Lord say to them? And they're rejoicing. When they came back in Luke chapter 10, When he said in verse 17, let's start there, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. 
Talk about being in the house of feasting. Boy, this, this was excitement to go out and in the name of the Lord to be able to cast out the devil. He said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He's declaring here that he's from eternity. That when Satan was cast out, he's the one that cast him down. And now being on earth, he was coming to defeat that serpent of old, crush his head. He would bruise his heels, it says there in Genesis 3.15, but the Lord would crush his head. That's where the venom is. And so it's as if the Lord's saying, you're not telling me anything. You rejoice. You come again with joy over this authority that the Lord had given them. He said in verse 19, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. See, that's what it means. That people that take the scriptures literally, and there are those cults today that think that if you really want to prove your faith, then they bring in actual venomous snakes. And uh, if you want to prove that you're true to the Lord, you come on up here, you grab this snake, and if it bites you and kills you, well, you weren't one of the Lord's. Snake handlers, what they call it. That's where that term snake oil comes from. These are pretenders. But that's not the sense here. When he says, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, the very next phrase explains it. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. There's nothing that can touch one of the Lord's but what comes through his hand. And so when we read that, again, through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the name which is above all names. And better than ointment, better than anything that this world has to offer. It's to be in Christ. And that by his power and his authority, just like John 16 says, he has conquered, he has overcome. And therefore in him, there is no enemy. There is no power that can touch us, but what has touched him. But verse 20, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not. Oh, we rejoice in who God has made us in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. <laughs> to live this life with nothing but to die, knowing that our name has been written in that Lamb's book of life. You can't have a better name than that, better than anything this world has to offer. It's to be in him. And so this is what Solomon is pondering here, coming back to my text in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, knowing that the end of all men is the same as death. Here he says in verse 2, for that is the end of all men and the living will lay it to his heart. When it says the living, it's not just the physically living, because there are a lot of people that are living, that attend funerals. In fact, years ago, someone gave me a subscription to the Shreveport Times, and I said, well, why do I need a subscription? It's all on the news and radio and everything. He said, the obituary. You want to be able to go there and read who's died and know which funerals you're going to attend. Well, I didn't grow up in Shreveport, and so this person, they had a lot of old friends that were dying, and that's all he did was take and read the newspaper and see who had died and then decide which funeral he's going to attend. But here when it says the living will let to his heart, there are a lot of people that go to the house of mourning, which is perhaps for them the funeral home. And if you've ever noticed and gone into a funeral home, there's a lot of levity. There's a lot of laughter. There's some that you see crying because they truly miss the one that's departed, but there's all kinds of conversations going on in a funeral. Lightness. And what happens when it's all over? They go home. 
and go on with life, never giving it a thought. I've used the illustration over and over again of cattle. When the butcher truck pulls up, their head pops up, they watch what happens, and they haul off a few of those cattle. As soon as that truck is down the road and out of the way, what do the cattle do? Go right back to eat. That's how people are without the Spirit of Christ. They learn nothing from the death of others. They don't reflect on the reality that their day is coming. But here when it says the living will lay it to his heart, I believe that's one who's been taught by the Spirit of God. We weigh these things. And every time we hear of someone dying, we lay it to heart because we know that that's been God executing his will. And if that person that died, I don't care how sumptuously they lived, how well known they were in the community, unless they were the Lord's, unless they were one for whom Christ paid the debt, that debt is an execution. God has executed his judgment and taken that person out. And people can stand around all day long and talk about how good a person they were or how blessed they were for all these things they had. But you know what? Vanity of vanity is always vanity. Doesn't matter how big a house they live in. Doesn't matter how nice a car they drove. None of that matters. And the, the reality is they leave it here for somebody else. So it was never theirs to begin with. These are the Lord's. To give and to take as he will. And so it's in this context that Solomon says here in verse 3, sorrow is better than laughter. It's not talking just about any kind of sorrow, but if by the Spirit of God and His grace He has taught us to mourn and to weep over our own sinfulness and to acknowledge and thank God for those times when we read the Scriptures and our heart is pierced, even by our own pride and our own sinfulness, and to consider that were God to mark iniquities, who could stand before a holy God? And even in that, to see how blessed is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would take such wretches as we are and save such by the blood of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, it's good to reflect and to think that when the Lord makes us sorrowful in this life, all of that's purposed, as the scriptures say, whom he loves, he chastens and scourges every son. I'd be concerned the other way, if there's no chastening, if there is no scourging, even of our own spirit in our hearts, that just means that God has left us to ourselves. It says here, for by the sadness, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. <laughs> you see, everything in Scripture is just the reverse of what men think. How on earth is the heart made better through the sadness of the countenance? Well, it's because that's an indication that God is dealing in the heart. And it's not all this little giddy, jump in the air, click your heels together, happy, happy, happy in Jesus. I know people try to portray themselves that way and to make you feel like if you're not giddy and happy like they are, then something's wrong with you. There's some that have been taught just almost like parents to say that I'm blessed, I'm rejoicing, put a smile on them. Well, that's not always a good thing. Better to know yourself as a sinner saved by grace and that the Spirit of God continues to show us what's in this heart. This heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? But when the Spirit of God takes and shows us what our heart is, and even in that, the sadness of the countenance. See, people don't like you to be sad. They don't like you to be in the house of mourning. But I'll tell you what, if the Lord calls you to mourn, there's nobody that's going to make you glad. 
And I dare say over the years, as I thought about the different trials and afflictions that the Lord has brought me through, my family, I thank him for those times because what it does, it kills pride, it kills presumption and brings you low at Christ's feet. There's no greater place of blessing than that. And it's all right. If someone says, is everything okay? You can tell them, look them in the eye and say, I'm thankful that the Lord is dealing graciously in my heart. You don't have to explain what he's doing. You don't have to, ooh, I better put on a smile. Why is it showing? Well, there's times where even when I go to prepare messages and I read these scriptures and understand what it is to stand here and speak to you of the glories of Christ, knowing myself to be a sinner, it's, it's a burden. And yet I thank God for how he deals in this heart to keep me from going down that path of, of this world and even in religion. Religion's a drug. That's why people keep going to these meetings because there's people there and they, they get them fired up and emotional. But I'll tell you what, it's unless the Spirit of God is present, unless this heart has been turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's nothing but bad. And here in verse 4, it says, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. <laughs> so I say everything about this is contrary to what the world thinks. But the heart of the fool is in the house of mirth. There's people that want to go and attend even places of worship where there's a lot of excitement, where there's music, where there's everybody goes and, and leaves feeling better about themselves. Well, here it says the heart of the fool is in the house of mirth. The heart of the wise, one made wise by the Spirit of God. There, herein is true wisdom. That as we come together even to worship, there's a quietness about how we worship. There's a reverence even in our singing. As we reflect upon the words that we sing. And where this heart is smitten. See, that's what the house of mourning is. It's seeing ourselves as we are before a holy God. as nothing. But Christ is all. I think about Christ being that wisdom, that the heart of Christ was in the house of mourning. He was made a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And we did despise him. Everything he bore, he did in the house of mourning while he was in this flesh. He's, not, he's no longer in the house of mourning. He came and accomplished everything that the Father sent him to do, and he's seated in the heavenlies ever to intercede on behalf of those that he came to redeem and has redeemed. And we see God's wisdom in how he came and how he lived and how he dwelt in this flesh to the glory and honor of the Father. Better to be identified with him in his suffering, his sorrow, than to have the heart of a fool in the house of mirth, thinking that somehow all is well when it's not. It's better, verse 5, Ecclesiastes 7, to hear the rebuke of the wise. See, that's what Paul wrote to Timothy there concerning the scriptures, that they're inspired of God. God breathed and are profitable for what? For doctrine. What's it say? For reproof, for correction, and for instruction righteousness. That the man of God might be truly furnished unto every good work. That's why I thank the Lord for the times that we spend in reading the word. Yes, we do sing because the Lord has instructed us to sing, but I'll tell you the most important part of our worship is sitting quietly and hearing the word read. And I'm thankful for the men that the Lord has placed here to stand and read the word of the Lord. And that he give us ears to hear. I know that a lot of people that drive right on by, that's not what they're looking for. And there are those compared to the fools that prefer a house of mirth. 
but it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise. Better to hear the rebuke of the wise one, which is none other than Christ himself, bringing conviction and rebuke to these hearts through his word and showing us that we're nothing apart from him. You see that on these marquees, on some of these religious centers, that this is a place where everybody is somebody. Saw that on a bus not too long ago, trying to attract people to their place of worship. That would be a good one to put out on our side, where everybody is nobody and Christ is all. That's, it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise. It's better to hear a message that declares us to be what we are, sinners, before holy God, without hope, without help, except through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he came, that righteousness, he came and earned and established, and God, once we're all imputed. That's not for everybody. Notice there in verse 5, it says, better to hear. That's not just physical ears, but hear. Being given spiritual ears. The rebuke of the wise. Rebuke of the wise one. Christ. Then for a man to hear the song of fools. People like songs. They like hymns. I was asking someone recently about the hymns they sung, and they, they said, oh, we just jokingly call it the 24-7 that it's a song that has 24 verses but repeats seven words all the time, just the same seven words. You know, hallelujah, something over and over again. That's the song of fools. Any song that's sung that is not sung to the glory and honor of Christ is nothing but a song of fools. That's why when we sing, it's with selection. There's a lot of hymns in our hymn book. I've gone through and put a big old X through them. Don't even look twice. Someone wrote them. And people like the tunes, but unless it's exalting the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work, it's nothing but a song of fools. Or as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Better to go to the house of mourning. What does the house of mourning teach us? Well, it teaches that we're nothing. It teaches us that apart from the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's nothing but the condemnation that awaits. That's why our Lord taught <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, and I'll close with this, what they call the Beatitudes, but really... These are manifestations of God's grace. You can see he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, what's the very first thing he teaches? Blessed are the poor in spirit. We bring nothing. But theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Better to be of that poor number that Christ came to save. And then what's the next thing? Blessed are they that mourn. When the spirit of God is pleased to teach our hearts, and cause us to mourn of ever having put any confidence in this flesh or in ourselves. It says there, they shall be comforted. How are they comforted? Well, they're comforted by the grace of God to know that it's for such that the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. Let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 334, Be Thou. My vision, that's the only vision we want, so again, 334, stand and sing this, and then we'll be dismissed. Amen. 
Next time, Lord willing.